Hello, everyone. This is a little different situation than our usual Wednesdays at 1, but I'm glad that you've tuned in uh, so that we can spend uh, at least a little bit of time in the Bible together as we have, and hopefully we'll be back together in person uh, really soon. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to get a Bible, or if you want to do this, uh, pull something up on your computer, do it online, however you want to do it. We're going to continue in Matthew chapter 12, as we have been, and we'll begin in the 15th verse of Matthew chapter 12. So what I'd like you to do is just pause this for a moment, get all the stuff that you need, and then restart the video. So what we know from Matthew chapter 12 so far is that Jesus has been moving around and uh, doing healings, and he's been sometimes kind of a tough guy, Jesus, and sometimes not so much. Um, he's been healing on the Sabbath, and this has gotten him into trouble with the Pharisees. And one of the things we know for certain is that this is the beginning of the end and uh, for Jesus. And so this is kind of good that we're doing this during Lent because now the Pharisees have really begun to, to work on their plot to, to deal with Jesus. The last verse before we start, in verse 14, it says, but the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. And we've talked previously, if, if you remember, about how important it was for the Pharisees to have their power and to have their place in society. Now, the best construction of that, as we know, is that the Pharisees were, as people say, just doing their job, and they were. It was their job to make sure that the laws of the Torah, that the laws of the Jewish people were upheld because that was so much of the Jewish people's identity. It was just full circle. Um, and the Pharisees were in charge of making sure that that happened. So as a category, as a, as a class, the word Pharisee isn't necessarily a bad thing. Unfortunately, the Pharisees who are now conspiring against Jesus have taken it too far. They see that their own power is threatened, and in many senses, they think that the Jewish people are threatened. And so they take it upon themselves to make sure that this threat to, uh, to the people, to all people, is neutralized and eliminated. As a result, you know, Jesus, excuse me, Jesus knows uh, what's going on. And so he's got to play this very interesting game between being tough, but also trying to elude um, and, and, and sneak by the Pharisees. It says in, uh, in verse 15, when Jesus became aware of this, he departed. Many crowds followed him, and he cured all of them, and he ordered them not to make him known. This is not the first time that he says this. It's... He, you know, we can say that, well, maybe he was playing a, a little bit coy or, or maybe he was uh, trying to do some kind of larger lesson. No, he, he knew that every time somebody started talking about the amazing things that he was doing, he knew there was going to be trouble. And so he asked them not to do so. Now, again, all the crowds continue to be amazed and, and, and shocked, really, as to what Jesus can do. Some of them, later on here in this, in this chapter, talk about how, well, he must be doing it through Beelzebul. He must be doing it through the power of Satan. And Jesus pulls out this little uh, philosophical proof, and, and one wonders if this is actually Jesus' words, or, or Matthew is the writer, or, or maybe someday later uh, uh, an addition to the text. But, but this is where 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 Jesus says, look, if Satan casts out Satan, well, then he's divided. And this is the passage where we get that very famous, a house divided amongst itself cannot stand. And that's where I wanted to spend just, just a moment. Uh, I voted today. <laughs> and and uh, when I uh, vote, I, I discovered that Illinois is a closed primary state. 
and, and that might not mean a whole lot to you if you've been around Illinois, but uh, not every state is a closed primary state. What that means is for a closed primary, you have to either be a Democrat or a Republican to be able to vote. And uh, in an open primary state, anyone can vote for anyone in the primary. I prefer those. Grew up in an open primary state. Um, and so the, the challenge today when I got to the polling place was being reminded, because it's just Democrats and Republicans, being reminded how divided this house uh, is against itself and how Jesus warned he really, really warned us uh, against that. You know, that if we weren't careful, how could we do good if we're divided against ourselves? And one of the hopes, at least one of my hopes, through this challenge of this uh, coronavirus right now, is that we will remember that we have a common humanity, that we are not going to get through this health crisis if we think we are a house divided, if people say things like, oh, well, this is just a political conspiracy, or, oh, this was just trumped up by the media, or this is a real thing. And Jesus was trying to point out in his time that what he was dealing with, people's illnesses, uh, blindness, uh, demons, all sorts of stuff. He confronts uh, blindness just a few verses before this. These were real things, you know, where everybody else was arguing about politics and, and, uh, and power and all the things that they wanted. Jesus was trying to shine a very, very bright light on what he was trying to do. And that's announce the kingdom of God and to show people what God is through Jesus' words and his actions. So he felt very, very strongly. And I think the same is true for congregations, for households. We're not always going to agree, but being uh, divided amongst ourselves, Jesus has said, is just not, not the way to go. Later on, he says something also that's uh, been pretty controversial over the, over the years. He says in verse 30, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the Jesus who was so interested in bringing people together would be so divisive, would be the kind of person who would say, oh, well, you're either with me or you're against me. You're either good or you're bad. You know, I, I, that doesn't sound like Jesus to me. It doesn't sound like the kind of savior who would give his life for all people. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Not just forgive that guy and that guy and that guy, but forgive them, they know not what they do. This brings up an important point about biblical uh, criticism, if you will, or understanding how the Bible was put together. Sometimes these, these sayings of Jesus, uh, we have to wonder where they came from. We have to wonder, how did this thing happen? How did this uh, get into the Bible? How is this thing that doesn't sound like Jesus end up there? Well, we'll never know. <laughs> it's the text, and so we have to wrestle with it, and we have to try to find some uh, sense in all of it. And maybe in this one, Jesus is really not so much wagging his finger or being angry, but instead saying, hey, come along with me. Uh, if you're not with me, you're, you really don't get it. You're, you're scattering instead of gathering. Two other things here before we uh, close up. He calls this, uh, he says, then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, and this is verse 38, teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. So of course, you know they're baiting him. You know, Do your tricks, Jesus, come on, show us, and then we're gonna be able to tell everybody else how you're a fraud. Says, but he answered, an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. 
For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so for three days and three nights the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth. Well, let's, let's consider wrapping it up there tonight. Obviously, Jesus is doing a little bit of foreshadowing. Again, is it Jesus? Hard to say. But we'll take it at face value. Just like Jonah was in the belly of the whale. How did Jonah get into the belly of the whale? Disobedience. God asked him to do something, and he didn't do it. And he ended up in the belly of the whale for three days, and then this is one of my favorite passages of, of, of all, especially in the Hebrew scripture. The word is that the, the whale, the big fish, vomits him out onto the seashore. Interesting. What's, what's a, a vomiting? Well, it's... If any of you have ever experienced it, I bet you have, you know that every, every bit of your stomach and your body really just squeezes as hard as it can and woof, out comes whatever the uh, offending agent is. And it is not fun. Uh, I, I don't know of anybody who really enjoys that experience. But what I always remember is that just squeezing so hard and forcing everything up and out. That might be an interesting way for us to think in this Lent about what happens to Jesus in those three days. He, he is not disobedient, so he doesn't end up on the cross because of disobedience like Jonah. But he is there as a sacrifice. And Jonah, too, was a sacrifice. Remember, he asked the people to throw him into the sea. And in a very similar way, Jesus sort of asks to be the sacrifice. By his words and by his actions, he puts himself in a place that eventually he can't get out of. And so he's crucified. And it's interesting that he makes this connection between Jonah and the whale and his own, you know, the son of man being, uh, as it says, in the heart of the earth. Because if you think about it, what happens? He dies on Friday afternoon, we believe. And he goes into the tomb. In our Apostles' Creed, it says he was crucified, died, and was buried, and he descended into hell. Well, if you think about that Jonah thing and you think about Jesus in the bowels of the earth in what we would call hell, you get this very kind of interesting connection. And that is how, and that is that the resurrection is not necessarily just a, a clean and shiny and happy event like we, like we have on Easter. You know, maybe we should, like the Orthodox Church does, maybe we should pay a little bit more attention to that Saturday, that time between the crucifixion and the resurrection. Because in the bowels of the earth, the bowels of the earth realize that this, this man, this Jesus, is there not of his own doing and not of his own fault. And the bowels of the earth really vomit him out. <laughs> The bowels of the earth contract completely and throw him back out of the earth, out of hell, out of all that mess, only to be then raised as Jonah was to continue his mission. Now, that might be kind of a gross, you know, nasty way to, to think about the resurrection, but I'm going to leave you with that now with that image. That the earth itself knew that it could not contain Jesus' goodness. That the earth itself knew that it could not contain him in his resurrected state. People say, well, why did he have to go? Why did he have to be ascended? Maybe that's it. Maybe it's because the earth itself could not 
bear him. And so he went to the Father. So next time, we will uh, continue with chapter 12. We'll finish up chapter 12 and maybe get into chapter 13. But consider in this Lent, consider in this time that he knows what's coming, but he doesn't fear, which is probably good words for all of us. We know what's happening, and perhaps we shouldn't fear. Thank you.